think about the path of suffering today. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day. To not be satisfied with just a little religion in life as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, from friends, from others. They were all influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we begin a series on the path of loneliness. As we think during the coming weeks about a refuge for our loneliness, about distinguishing loneliness from solitude, for loneliness as a wilderness, and a love that will not let go. That's in the coming weeks. Today it's the first two in that series, The Sudden Tide and What to Do with Loneliness. One of the things about Elizabeth is that she wasn't afraid to deal with the tough issues of life, loneliness, suffering. Eileen Chambers has some thoughts on that coming up. And also we'll hear from Steve McCulley. His father, Ed, was one of the five missionaries killed. He'll be talking about suffering and about the influence of Elizabeth's writings on his life. That's coming later. First, though, let's get our Path of Loneliness series started. The Sudden Tide. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you about loneliness. This talk on the sudden tide. It was midnight and I was flying in a plane seated next to the window and in the two seats next to me sat what I took to be a man and wife. The moon was shining on the clouds, making them look like cobblestones. The plane was silent. The stewardess moved quietly up and down the aisles, took a pillow to someone. My legs were cramped. It was one of those planes that doesn't give you a whole lot of leg room. And as far as I could tell, the man and woman next to me were asleep. Then I noticed the woman was rummaging in her purse for something. She pulled out a cigarette. The man reached into his pocket, and there was a tiny flame as I saw his hand reach toward her to light the cigarette. It was just the flash of a moment, meaning, I suppose, nothing to them. But it happened that I had been widowed not very long before this, and just the sight of a man's hand reaching toward a woman to help brought over me what I called the sudden tide, that overwhelming feeling of loneliness. I thought of the hand which was now gone. It had rather square nails, strong fingers for carpentry and for hammering. Also, it was a gentle hand, and I thought of the man that belonged to that hand and how I would never see him again except in heaven, never feel the touch of that hand. And, of course, I got terribly sentimental. I thought to myself how blessed it was to have had him. I was really greatly blessed. And yet that didn't stop the fact that the sudden tide of loneliness swept over me. I'm convinced as I think about all these letters that I get from many different kinds of people in many different places in the world, that everyone experiences loneliness. Perhaps all of us, all the time, in some form or other. Because as Augustine said, God has made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until we rest in him. My files are really full of letters from lonely people. Widows, widowers, bereaved parents, single people who would love to get married, and, believe it or not, married people. I get many letters from married people who are lonely. And I wonder sometimes what to say to these people. In fact, I wonder every time I get a letter, how shall I answer this person? Because her experience or his experience is not exactly the same as mine although it may be a person who's lost a husband, and I've lost two, it doesn't mean that I can 
say to that person, I know exactly what you're going through because I'm not that person. And that person has had a different set of experiences, a different background, is probably of a different temperament. And the experience of loss to that person is something different from my own experience of loss. And so I pray that God will give me the words to speak. And I pray the same thing as I speak to you today. I don't know who's tuned in on the radio. I don't know whether you're alone in a house which seems very big and very empty, whether you may be driving down the highway away from someone whom you love very much. Maybe you're driving just to work and thinking how bleak it is down there at the job. Maybe you don't like the job very well. Maybe you feel like a fish out of water. Maybe you have no friends. You've moved to a new city. I don't know what your experience is. You are loved with an everlasting love. And there is one who has been over that road himself. Jesus Christ came into this world. It was a lonely world when he came into it. And the Bible says when he came unto his own, his own did not receive him. He experienced rejection, loneliness, isolation, and what I call the wilderness experience. He had a literal wilderness experience, and to me, loneliness often seems like a wilderness experience. Sometimes I write to these people and say, make an offering of your loneliness. Just take that thing which seems so hard for you to cope with and take it in your hands, in your imagination, and lift it up to God. I lived many years in the jungle of South America as a missionary, usually in isolated places. One place where I lived was three days by trail and canoe from the nearest mission station. And most of the time that I was there, there was no one else who spoke English. Part of the time, my colleague Rachel Saint was there. All the time, my little three-year-old daughter was there, but her conversations were not so terribly fascinating. And she spoke most of the time the Indian language with her Indian friends. And when I've told some of those experiences, people have said to me, how did you handle loneliness? Well, that word handle is not really one that occurs very often in my vocabulary because I didn't really feel that I could handle loneliness. It was too much for me. I accepted loneliness for a start because it's one of the things which a missionary expects. When I have the opportunity to speak to prospective young missionaries, and they ask me for advice, I tell them, well, remember, you're going to be a foreigner. You're going to be lonely. You're going to feel like a fish out of water. You're going to feel very isolated and perhaps freakish. I was a freak among the people that I lived with because they were jungle Indians. One of the tribes that I worked with had never even seen a stranger of any color, let alone a white woman. And so there was a peculiar kind of loneliness. And so there was a peculiar kind of loneliness which I had to offer up to God. It was one of the terms of my missionary life. But I'm convinced that one of the terms of human life is loneliness. Because until we return to God by faith and receive him as a deliberate willed act on our own part, we're separated from him. There is a sense in which we are isolated in the cosmos, in the world, and we need to come to him and ask him to be our companion. I'm sure that some of you are familiar with the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. She's one of my favorites, and I remember how this poem just spoke exactly to my need after my husband had been killed. Listen, children, your father is dead. From his old coats, I'll make you little jackets. I'll make you little trousers from his old pants. There'll be in his pockets things he used to put there, keys and pennies covered with tobacco. Dan shall have the pennies to save in his bank. Anne shall have the keys to make a pretty noise with. Life must go on and the dead be forgotten. Life must go on, though good men die. Anne, eat your breakfast. Dan, 
Take your medicine. Life must go on. I forget just why. When my husband died back in 1956, killed by the jungle Indians to whom he had gone to take the gospel of Christ, I knew that life must go on, and I think I had a better answer than Edna St. Vincent Millay. She forgot just why, and I understand her feeling. There were certainly times when I felt as if life had no purpose. It came across to me then that almost everything I had done around the house was for Jim. I would wake up in the morning and think, why bother to get out of bed? doesn't really matter to him. Why bother to comb my hair? There's nobody here who cares. Why bother to clean the house? Nobody will notice. Only my little daughter, who was 10 months old when he died. And I had the same feeling that she had. Eat your breakfast, take your medicine, life must go on. I forget just why. But at the same time, deep underneath all of those human feelings, was a conviction that my life was not my own. It belonged to somebody else. I had given my life to Jesus Christ when I was a small child. I had asked him to be Lord of my life when I was about 12 years old. And nothing had changed as far as he was concerned. My life seemed to have changed radically. But the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I can remember moving around the house, looking at the things that Jim had made, opening the closet from which I thought I had removed all of his clothes and finding a pair of shoes way back in the corner with the shape of his feet still so plain to see. And I thought of the 23rd Psalm, one that's familiar to many. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or as one little girl said, it means that's all I want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And those beautiful words, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the psalmist doesn't say I will fear no evil because there isn't any. He says, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That's the key to loneliness. Remember that you're never alone. The shepherd is there. He never forsakes his sheep. And the very loneliness itself can be an experience in which you learn to know that shepherd if you've never known him before. The first in an eight-part series on the path of loneliness, the sudden tide. Well, as you think about tough issues like loneliness... Maybe you remember how Elizabeth was very willing to deal with those tough issues. Eileen Chambers was a longtime friend of Elizabeth, as well as the screenwriter for Valerie's book, Devotedly. You see, when it came to the Christian faith and following Jesus, Elizabeth Elliot pulled no punches. And as hard as it is for us to imagine today, she was a Christian who was not afraid to be unpopular or to address the tough questions and issues. As I've said before, to me, she was a real deal. And if you look at her life, it's highs and lows. I know you will find in her a Christian who walked the talk. Jesus was her closest companion. His word, the Bible, the place where she encountered him, the living God every day. And in a world No less unstable and topsy-turvy than ours, Elizabeth trusted and believed him even to the end. And the good news is that because of the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation, her teachings, life story, and presence lives on. My hope for you is that you'll partake deeply and discover not only Elizabeth Elliot, but the Jesus Christ whom she loved. Friend and writer Eileen Chambers. Later on, we'll be hearing from Steve McCulley. His father, Ed McCulley, was one of the five missionaries killed. He'll be talking about Elizabeth's impact on him, especially in her writings. Uh, Hear about that later on. First, though, it's The Path of Loneliness, Part 2. What to do with loneliness? Loneliness, 
not something that people generally want to deal with. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you about loneliness, this time what to do with loneliness. As I mentioned in my last talk, one husband, Jim Elliot, died back in 1956, and 13 years after he died, the miracle, which I was sure could never happen, happened. Another man came along and actually asked me to marry him. I knew when I married Addison Leach in 1969 that I would probably be a widow again. I really didn't expect it to be quite so soon. Ad was 18 years older than I was. I was 42. He was 60 when we were married. And three years after our wedding, we learned that Ad had cancer. So you can imagine some of the dialogues that went on between God and me when we learned that piece of news. I said, Lord, we've been through this once before, haven't we? And he said, yes. And I said, Lord, you wouldn't take him away from me, would you? And he said, I might. But Lord, did I flunk the tests? And he said, no. And of course, I asked the question that all of us ask when anything happens that seems incomprehensible. Why? And God's answer was the same to me then as I think it is most of the time to all of us when we ask that question. Trust me. And so for 10 months, I had to learn one day at a time to trust God. And finally, I had to watch my husband disintegrate from about 200 pounds down to 125. And then I saw him die. I had prayed the big prayer that God would heal him. Other people came and prayed over him and anointed him and told me that they had received a word of knowledge from God that he was going to be healed. And I had prayed with them, of course, that God would heal him. And I meant literal physical healing from cancer, which I knew would have to be a miracle. But I had also prayed, thy will be done. And I had prayed some smaller prayers, one that he would not die in a hospital. I really wanted him to be at home and to be able to take care of him. And I had prayed toward the last few weeks, Lord, please let me be with him when he dies. And God answered those two smaller prayers. He was not in the hospital, and I was with him when he died. And there was a sense of tremendous peace that day. I remember it. I had felt that God had given me all the peace that I needed throughout those 10 months. And yet I had not felt that he had granted it to my husband. And I had prayed that God would give him peace. And in that last day, I saw that prayer answered. He was perfectly conscious. He was aware that he was dying. And he was at peace. And a couple of days later, at the funeral, I felt buoyed up almost with a sense of exuberance and joy. I'll never forget the singing of that great old Welsh hymn, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. And there's a stanza in there that refers to Jesus Christ as the death of death. Those words are capitalized in the hymn. Death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. And you know, Jesus Christ, through his death, destroyed the power of death and when he rose again from the dead, he rose in order that we too might rise with him. And that thought was just an overwhelming one of joy to me. I'm sure that some of the onlookers were looking at the widow and wondering perhaps why she wasn't dissolved in tears. I can well imagine that some of them were thinking, well, she must be made of cement. Well, she went through this once before. Maybe she's gotten calloused. I don't know what they were thinking. But I know that the answer my, for me was that there really is such a thing as the peace that passes understanding. God gave me that peace. And Dr. Roger Nicole of Gordon-Conwell Seminary was one of the speakers at that funeral, and he quoted these old familiar words, 
Think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven, of taking hold of a hand and finding it God's hand, of breathing new air and finding it celestial air, of feeling invigorated and finding it immortality, of passing from storm and tempest to unbroken calm, of waking up and finding it home. A few weeks after my husband had died, I was in the supermarket one day just doing my ordinary grocery shopping, and suddenly that sudden tide of loneliness just swept over me with such power that I found myself absolutely sobbing in the aisle of the supermarket. I was as surprised as anyone else would have been if they happened to see me. I don't suppose anybody did, at least I hoped that they didn't. And if someone had and had asked me what was wrong, could I have said, yes, my husband died three weeks ago. I wonder what they would have thought. But you who listen to me perhaps know exactly what I'm talking about. The experience of being born up through what may seem like the worst of a time and then of dissolving and going to pieces at a most unpredicted moment. What shall we do with these tears? I'm greatly comforted by Psalm 56, verse 8. The psalmist prays, Put thou my tears in thy bottle. I don't know exactly what that means. I'm sure it's metaphorical language. But I do believe that there is a sense in which God does not miss one single one of our tears. And if we ask him to, he can do something with them. He can make something else out of them. Some years after that, I was married to the man that I'm married to now. His name is Lars Grin, my third husband. We were in a hotel one night, and in order to get to the dining room, we had to walk through a very loud, noisy bar where that crashing, smashing, thundering kind of music was being played. And there were a lot of people that looked very lonely to us. I suppose it was a singles bar, or maybe it was just the bar, but it was obviously the place where there were a good many singles looking for companionship, I suppose. We felt sorry for them. We felt grateful to God that we were together, that we had each other. On that same trip, I picked up an airline magazine and read an article about Toronto, which gave the options for singles. It said you can join a singles club in Toronto, you can call a dating service, you can go to a dance club or a dining club, or if you're into adult education, you can sign up for something called culinary courtship, which lets you eat a progressive dinner every six weeks with each of four courses consumed at a different table with five or six different faces. If you want to lay out $695, you can buy six introductions to members of the opposite, or according to your preference, the same, sex, and be taught how to act, dress, and talk in can't-miss ways to lure them. For a cool $1,000, you can get your name on a list that gives you a chance, not a guarantee, to be called by the rich and famous, that is, men who make $100,000 or more. The article didn't tell us what famous meant. In Birmingham, I read that a hostess had paired her party guests and had a uniformed guard handcuff each couple together for the entire evening. And she said they had to swim and eat and do everything, except visits to the restroom, together. But, she said, it never resulted in any permanent couplings. Near our home in Massachusetts, there's an enormous grocery emporium that sponsors singles nights when the unattached can shop for food and for each other. They call it the meat market, and that's spelled M-E-E-T. The personal columns of newspapers and magazines are a measure of the desperation men and women feel in their loneliness. You've seen those personal ads, I'm sure, I read them with utter astonishment. They take my breath away, the descriptions that people give of themselves. In fact, I saw one that was a whole page long. I don't know how much that woman must have paid for that, but she sounded like the most perfect woman that ever walked this earth. 
and she was desperately asking men to call or write. So we're talking about loneliness. What do we do with it? God is there waiting for us to turn to him in our loneliness. He is the answer. And I know through many different kinds of experience that he's there, he's waiting to hear our prayers, and he really can do something with it. God was not going to bring my husband back. Nothing that people said to me was going to bring my husband back. And sometimes I felt a little bit angry that people said such simple platitudes. And yet they were true. There is a peace that passes understanding. Think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven. Put thou my tears in thy bottle. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The shepherd was with me. He is with me. He wants to walk with you. He will lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. What to do with loneliness. Gateway to joy number 16. Part two in the Path of Loneliness series. Here's Steve McCulley. A little background on Steve. He loved sports and school and became a teacher and a coach, teaching for decades, coaching mostly football, but also basketball and track, along with wrestling, soccer, and softball along the way. But today, his topic is Elizabeth Elliot and her writings along with the issue of suffering, very much a part of the uh, series we're currently in. Steve McCulley. My biggest connection by far with her work was, was her writing. I've read all of her books and uh, was so touched by so many of them. Uh, one of my favorites was uh, Love Has a Price Tag, but it's got just some real treasures in there. Of course, maybe my very favorite one of all of them was the one that was published after she died. You know, suffering is never for nothing, and it is it's so rich and it's just saturated with scripture and it's just so thoughtful. Uh, and the thing that really stood out to me was, you know, they took it from her talking and they tried to not change it, so it's like she's talking to you. And and I know so many people who feel the same way. I remember teaching. I was a teacher forever, and, and when one of the guys I was teaching with heard that my you know my family story, he said, "Do you know Elizabeth Elliot?" I said, "Yeah, I do." And he said, "My wife just listens to Gateway to Joy every day. She's her biggest fan." You know, and I've heard that type of thing so often. I was just asked to speak a couple months ago, telling the story at a church. Afterwards, a lady came up to me and just couldn't wait to meet me. And she said, I want you to meet my nine-year-old daughter. Her name's Elizabeth. I named her after Elizabeth Elliot. Steve McCauley, whose dad, Ed McCauley, was one of the five missionaries killed in Operation Alka. Well, as we wrap up our time together today, remember what Elizabeth wrote in A Chance to Die, The Life and Legacy of Amy Carmichael. Faith does not eliminate questions but faith knows where to take them. Hey, thanks for joining with us today as we uh, come along with you in your office, your home, wherever we found you today, maybe out uh, taking a walk. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. Talks, devotionals, videos, and more, elizabethelliot.org. And if you get a chance, leave us a podcast review. Thanks. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms.